Welcome back to Guerrilla Radio's Home Edition, recorded on this date, December 15th, 2020. Well, last month, the federal government of Ethiopia attacked the newly elected provincial government in the country's northern Tigray region. Acting Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said the reason for the military action was in response to a raid on a federal army base within Tigray by the regional government as part of its plan to secede. But there's much more going on behind the scenes than what's reported by Abby, and much more behind his rise to power, too. Finian Cunningham is a longtime and prolific journalist who worked as an editor and writer for the major UK media outlets The Mirror, Irish Times, and Independent. The two times Serena Shim Award for Uncompromising Integrity in Journalism recipients' articles on international affairs appear at numerous online outlets, including Sputnik, where I found his article, Nobel winning Ethiopian PM has overseen country's descent into barbarity and madness, written as the conflict was beginning in early November. Today, Finian Cunningham and ushering chaos in Ethiopia. Well, welcome to the program, Finian. Yes, thanks, Chris, for having me on. Well, it's my great pleasure, of course. Now, maybe I should say welcome back to the program. Uh, before we get going, uh, uh, Finian, can you, uh, congratulations, firstly, on your second Serena Shim Award. A- and who exactly, Finian, uh, was Serena Shim? And what is the criterion for the award uh, named for her? Well, the, the award is uh, dedicated to the memory of a great journalist by the name of Serena Shim. She was a Lebanese-American journalist, and she was working in Syria for uh, Press TV, and um, she was doing great investigative reporting on the role of Turkey, the nefarious role of covert role of Turkey in sponsoring these uh, terrorists that were infiltrating and trying to subvert Syria. And uh, in 2014, uh, Serena Shim was was killed on the job. Uh, she was traveling across the Turkish border in uh, northern Syria and she was killed on the job. And her family have always claimed that there was something very sinister in that incident and they believe she was assassinated by Turkish military intelligence. Um, so the, the award is dedicated to the memory of Serena Shim and her great style of journalism, truth telling. And integrity, uh, uncompromising integrity, and she paid with it with her life. So it's a great honor to be uh, nominated for and receiving the award. And um, I'm, I'm just so humble and humbly, uh, you know, thankful to have received it. Well, yeah, these are d- dangerous years indeed for for journalists all over the place, uh, no less uh, Julian Assange. Uh, Sitting in a, a London prison at this mm-hmm. very moment. Well, well, Finian, you, you're familiar. You're very familiar, yeah. actually, with Ethiopian history and and politics. And your article on the Nobel laureate prime minister uh, provides a, fa- a fascinating uh, backstory to a man a few in the West know much about. Just who is he? Who is Abiy Ahmed? Uh, well, he he's about 44 years old, so he's relatively young as uh, leaders go, and African leaders in particular. Um, his his rise to power is, is something of a phenomenon. I mean, he just ca- was catapulted into the prime minister or prime minister's role uh, in April, in April 2018, and it it kind of came about with a lot of like obscure, opaque horse dealing and backroom dealing and and all sorts of things. I mean, he was a previously he was a minister of science and technology in the former government, which was a, a coalition government primarily headed up by a faction called the the Tigray People's Liberation Front, the TPLF, and they were in among a coalition um, government of other revolutionary parties. Um, And Abiy Ahmed, although he's from the Oromo uh, ethnic group, which is the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia, but he was in a minister of technology, science and technology, in this uh, previous uh, coalition government, which he now, in retrospect, is kind of really, you know, denigrating and accusing of all sorts of violations. So there's something a little bit kind of a 
fabulatory about what he's portraying the past to be. I mean, he's portraying it as some sort of like horrible, despotic past. But I mean, he was part of it. He was he was actually in that government. And and I think, uh, Chris, in my experience of Ethiopia, there's a lot of exaggeration and a lot of fabrication about the alleged violations of the previous government. And as I say, he was a part of it. So if he's accusing the the past government of violations well then he's complicit too and he has got a he should be answering for it so it's it's a little bit rich for him to be throwing around bricks in a glass house and and you know knowing that he was part and parcel of that previous government so there's a lot of there's a lot of history re- revisionism going on and that's to do with justifying his whole present onslaught against the Tigray region. I mean, he's, you know, accusing the, the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Fund, of being despotic and treasonous and all the rest of it. So it's it's his way of justifying his campaign of aggression against the Tigray people by trying to, uh, you know, um, besmirch and, and um, you know, denigrate the, the, the TPLF. That's that's what I think is going very much is going on. As as a man in search of justification, uh, he really needs justification. He wasn't yeah. elected to anything. He wasn't elected to the prime ministership, was he? Well, exactly, Chris. Well, well said. Well, uh, you know, put up there. I mean, yeah, he he as part of his ascent to power, and it was a really you know meteoric kind of rise to power from nowhere sort of thing. Uh, He was made the caretaker or interim prime minister. He was never elected. His uh, function or uh, uh, responsibility was to oversee a kind of a transition period and then call a whole national election, which was supposed to have happened earlier this year. And he didn't. He cancelled that under the um, pretext of you know, public health safety because of the coronavirus pandemic. And he, he cancelled that election. But other people would have, were cynical about that and, and, and saying, look, this is just a kind of an excuse to, to for a power grab, you know, and to avoid the answering to the people in a, in a democratic process. You know, just to hog on to the power, uh, you, you know, that he had acquired as the interim prime minister. Now, the TPLF, the, well, the Tigray region, there's nine regions in, nine uh, re- regional governments in Ethiopia as a part of a federation. And the, Ethio- uh, the Tigray region went ahead with their elections, as was scheduled. And, and because they did that, then they became, you know, they were under attack and rebuked for being secessionists or treasonists, they were just holding a regional, their, their right to hold their regional election, as was part of a scheduled national election. So, you know, it's a little bit rich that he's accusing them of sedition and treason and all sorts of things whenever he was the one who, who abdicated his responsibility to have the whole election. And he did that, you know, people would, critics would say, because he wanted to just avert the uh, answering to the to the nation and he just wanted to uh, you know um arrogate power to himself under a sort of a one man rule without any election well and people should understand that uh, the Ethiopian federal constitution allows the regions a lot more latitude and a lot more power and for them to hold their elections and to secede from the union if they choose to is a part of the constitution yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Chris, can I just come in there? I mean, you see, in your introduction, uh, which is a fine introduction, but their claim that his claim that they have launched this operation to try to bring the the, the rest of Tigray region uh, under some sort of like um, law and order control is just uh, a load of nonsense. I mean, I was living in Ethiopia, in the Tigray region, and ever since that guy came to power, the Tigray region has just been hammered with um, low-intensity low hostility, low-intensity low aggression in the form of cuts to electricity, cuts to water, cuts to internet services, cuts to transport. I mean, the, the, the area was under duress. There was a campaign, a war, a low-intensity war campaign building, and then it culminated just last month in a full-blown onslaught military offensive. You know, so the idea that he's just kind of like uh, triggered by what the, the Tigray region did with their elections is just, you know... Um, a complete falsehood. He, th- th- this, uh, this aggression has been building over over two years, 
then, you know, now he's kind of like them making out that the, the TPLF attacked a military base. Chris, look, for two years, he was messing around with the military. He was drawing down military equipment, drawing down military bases in Tigray. You're making the, the area, the region vulnerable to attack. This has been a campaign to, uh, you, you know, subjugate that region. And it's not just kind of out of the blue. And he's not just kind of like, uh, you know, reacting to, to kind of alleged violations or breaches by the the tplf he, he he's kind of a, he's been pushing an agenda of aggression well last summer too uh, there was the assassination of uh hakalu hondisa uh the the pop singer well more than a pop singer a folk singer and a political figure in the country and a year before that uh you write about general sarar mcconan M- uh, i p- p- please correct my pronunciation yeah. A very prominent uh, yeah. military man and figure uh, that too was assassinated. What's oh, the story behind that, Chris? I'm glad you brought this in because this isn't just exclusively a, a kind of a campaign against the Tigray region. Abiy Ahmed, ever since he um, sort of mysteriously and very suspiciously gained power, has been running a campaign to subjugate all the region, including his own Oromo region. And what he's trying to do is take away the autonomy of these regions and put in his own men to write, to, to fashion the country in his and his sponsors, his foreign sponsors, agenda, you know, it, 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 you refashioning the country. Now, he's been going around all those nine regions, all those nine regional governments, and causing mayhem over the last two years. It hasn't been getting into the media because that's just the nature of the media and, and what happens in Africa. There hasn't been much coverage of it. But it did, it did get into the media when that uh, singer activist from Aruba w- was assassinated. And his, his murder, I have no doubt about it, was carried out by Abe's regime because he was very critical of Abe, although he's a fellow Romo, but he was very critical of Abe's regime and what he was ter- doing to the country, turning it upside down. And in, in all these regions over the last two years, there's been absolute mayhem, vile, you know, like internecine violence, you know, massive killings, and, and, you know, under very suspicious circumstances. I mean, who are ca- carrying out these killings? We believe, I believe, and, and a lot of other people believe that th- this is is all part of a covert operation by Abe's regime, sending in paramilitary death squads to uh, sow uh, chaos and, and, and mayhem in these regions, which then would allow him to subvert the regional government and put in his own placement. Now, I'll just deal with the, the, the assassination of General Sarah, Sarah McConan. This is crucial, Chris. This is really crucial for all your listeners who want to know what's going on in Ethiopia. They must, they must try to uh, concentrate on this. General Sarah McConan was an ex-TPLF fighter, a hero in the Revolutionary War, a war against the Derg regime 30 years ago. And then when they, the revolution succeeded, um, the TPLF formed a coalition government with other revolutionary groups. And they formed a whole Ethiopian National Defence Force. It just wasn't a TPLF, uh, you know, militia anymore. They, they formed a proper federal army. General Sarah McConan was revered as a national hero, part of that liberation uh, war that overthrew the the despotic Derg regime. And, you know, the the federal army that was formed out of that became a very professional, well-run army, the Ethiopian National Defence Forces. General Sarah McConan was made the chief of staff. He was the head man, the, the, the top commander of the Ethiopian National Defence Forces. Now, in June 2019, he, he was assassinated and it was very, very suspicious what happened. I mean, his security detail was changed almost the day before and he was assassinated in his house and his wife was present uh, as well. Uh, the, the killer, the shooter, was brought into cu- taken into custody, and there was supposed to be some sort of a prosecu- prosecution case, but the prosecution case fell apart. Mysteriously, nothing ever came out of it. And his, the widow of Senator General uh, Sarah McConan, only a few months ago, was complaining that there was a lack of justice. And she said, all my efforts to try and contact Abbe Ahmed to appeal to him to find out what's going on about my husband's death, murder, have all kind of fallen on deaf ears. He's, he's refusing to take my calls. So I, I, I'm i quite sure, Chris, that General Sarah McConan, that was a political assassination to take him out, 
Why? Because if he ha- was presently in his position of chief of staff of the Ethiopian National Defence Forces, he, there's no way that this army would be carrying out the onslaught on Tigray, his native Tigray region. There is no way he would have consented to that. You know, so he had to be taken out in order to give Abe regime a free hand to carry out this next step of their uh, campaign to uh, overhaul Ethiopia in, 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 you know, in, in the way that they wanted. And Tigray was the last part of the jigsaw puzzle. It was the toughest nut to crack because it's, it's a very strong area, a very strong opposition. They never liked Abe. Abe they always suspected he was up to something untoward. And so they were, they were if you like, the last domino to, to be addressed. All the other regions were kind of subverted by him over the last two years, but Tigray was the bastion, the last remaining bastion, preventing him from overall control. So General McConan would have definitely, uh, his assassination was necessary in order to give the uh, Abe regime the, the, the freedom to do what they're doing right now. Now, not many people would have heard of that assassination, but you can look it up. General Sahara McConan, look up the, 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 the details on it. If you just tuned in, you're listening to Guerrilla Radio. I'm speaking today with Finian Cunningham. Finian is a long time, and he's a very prolific journalist. He's worked as an editor and writer for outlets like The Mirror, The Irish Times, and The Independent. He's a two-time Serena Shim Award recipient. We're talking today about, uh, well, ostensibly about his recent article, uh, well, not too recent, but uh, last month's article in Sputnik. Nobel-winning Ethiopian PM has overseen the country's descent into barbarity and madness. In that article, Finney, and you write something that's fascinating, something I haven't seen anywhere else, and you say, quote, the way t- Tigray people see it, Abby, who is alleged to have spent periods of time as an intelligence officer, seconded in the U.S. while a member of the TPLF-led former government, is working for a foreign agenda to undermine Ethiopia's independent politics and economic development. That is a, an astounding claim to make, especially of somebody who is the current, if unelected, prime minister of the country. Chris, I I know that's that's pretty, uh, it's a pretty uh, serious uh, claim or or kind of accusation. But I mean, look at what this so-called leader is doing. I mean, he's he's committing a a slaughter on his own people, you know, uh, not just in Tigray, but around the country. So the the quality of this man is, is very low indeed. I mean, I, I, he's capable of doing anything. I mean, he, he's, he's conducting a, I, I would say, and it's not an exaggeration, a genocidal campaign in Tigray, uh, displacing 45,000 people into Sudan and a million internally. There's people cut off from all sorts of services. This isn't, a, this isn't a man of integrity. This isn't a man of any principle. This is a man who's just pursuing a very ruthless agenda for for. Uh, I think for 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 foreign uh, sponsors, uh, and the Nobel Peace Prize is all part of the charade. I mean, he got that prize kind of a year after he became this caretaker prime minister, and it was it was very strange. Like he get this gets this Nobel Peace Prize, and nobody had ever heard of him before. And what was it for? It was allegedly for c- cutting a peace deal with Eritrea to the north of Ethiopia. And those two countries have had a, a long running dispute over a border after a, a brief but bloody war in, in the um, around two thousand. So he makes his peace deal with Eritrea, but nobody really knows what, what's in the peace deal. There's no details, there's no roadmap, there's no practical benefits. I mean, we we have family on both sides of the border in Tigray, on, on the Eritrean side and, and uh, on the Ethiopian side, and they're, they're related. Those people are Tigray people, and, but they're still prevented from seeing each other, family reunifications. The border is is still kind of like, a, like an iron curtain. So, I mean, what was the peace deal about? It, it wasn't really about anything. I mean, nobody has ever seen any kind of practical fruits, but, you know, beneficial fruits. So the peace, the Nobel Peace Prize, in, in my opinion, and I think other, a lot of other people's opinion, it was part of the PR campaign to build this guy up as somebody with credibility. 
And then when he could, when he carried out the so-called reforms, you know, just a scorched earth campaign, not reforms, but a scorched earth campaign, which in the West was called reforms. But with the Peace Prize accolade, he could be quoted as, you know, Nobel Peace Laureate uh, Abiy Ahmed, the reforming prime minister. So that Peace Prize has really given him a lot of purchase and a lot of credibility that he, he would never, ever have. And now I think... This is a part of a bigger, much bigger, sophisticated picture where he is working for the CIA. He was part of the Ethiopian military intelligence. He was a lieutenant colonel. He would have worked closely with the CIA to set up the Ethiopian National Security Agency, the equivalent of the American agency. And in that milieu, he, he would have been ripe for for recruitment for into the CIA. And they kind of hedge their bets with loads of these kind of characters, you know, to one day fulfill some favor for them. And and he's I think, you know, he's delivering on some kind of favor for for the CIA. Getting Ethiopia, reorienting Ethiopia away from partnership with China, which it had very much been over the last 30 years under the previous government, the TPLF led coalition government, China was a major, was the major economic partner. And the Americans, and it's not just about Ethiopia, it's the whole of Africa. The, the, there's a competition, this great power rivalry going on to between the Americans to try to claw back uh, you, you know, positions vis-a-vis -vis China, especially in, in Africa. And Ethiopia is part of that whole kind of, um, you know, great power competition. Well, and Finian too. This his uh, um, Abby's re relationship with the president uh, Isaiah of uh, of Eritrea ha has raised eyebrows as well. I mean, they've done everything but walk around holding hands, it seems. And now the Eritrean <laughs> the Eritrean military yeah. is too involved in this. Uh, the er Eritrea, by the way, as the as uh, cited by the International Business Times as one of the world's most authoritarian states. But uh, you also mentioned that the the dam. This great uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project uh, plays a factor. In the last two minutes that we have or so, Finian, can you uh, just des describe what the dam is and what role you think it plays in what we're seeing unfold right now in Ethiopia? Well, this uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam will be, when it comes online, Chris, it will be the biggest hydroelectric power plant in the whole of Africa. And the whole of Africa, this is the will be the, the premier uh, hydroelectric power station planned to export electricity sur to surrounding East African countries. Now, up till recently, it's been totally financed by Ethiopia's own resources. Under the previous government, they, they actually um, shunned any kind of like Western capital involvement in that dam. And they, they tried to finance it with their own resources. I mean, through lot, lottery fundraising across the nation. I mean, 110 million people you know, could raise quite a lot of money, in, even in small dribs and drabs. So they, they kind of tried to finance it itself. Now, Abiy Ahmed, when he came into... Uh, you know, got into this position of prime minister, he, he set about denigrating and undermining the whole dam as being a corrupt project, as, you know, it was behind time, it was blah, blah, blah. And, you know, very quickly too, the, the chief engineer of the dam, Semeknu Bekele, was assassinated three months after Abe came to power. Now, he he was assassinated, I, I believe, because he would have de demolished Abbey's attempt to denigrate the dam and to to, to bad mouth it. He would have, from his te technical knowledge, he would have rubbished all, all the campaign to to denigrate the dam and to to try to make out that it was um, uh, behind target and all that stuff. Now, I think that the whole idea to kind of denigrate the dam is to then refinance it with Western capital, you know, loans from the World Bank or something like that, and through. Uh, incurring, you know, taking on massive debts from the West, that, that gives the West then debt control over what was formerly an independent African country. And I think the dam is key to it. It's not just the dam. I mean, I think it's the whole economy. There's lots of state-owned industries that are lined up to be privatized, like the air, airlines, the, the telecoms and other things. So I think Abiy Ahmed is trying to reorient the whole, the whole country away from China, away from independence, towards Western capital control. And the dam is central to 
see that, and, and that's why there was that horrible murder of the chief engineer, a mysterious, out of the blue, murder of, uh, killing of, of the engineer. It was, it's part of the agenda to subvert the country and to subjugate it according to uh, Western interests. Well, and send in the economic hitman. This sounds uh, like a very familiar yeah, scenario. Like, uh, John, John Perkins' uh, great book, uh, "The Confessions of an Economic Hitman." Exactly. You know, you, this... you 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 give a you shower a country with loads, billions of dollars for high prestige infrastructure, and th from then on, you've got them like a drug dealer would have a junkie. I mean, that's it. They're bought. They're they're they will be under control in every way from all economic social policies. Well, Finian, we're, we're fast out of time. What do you recommend as, an, as news sources? As you said, uh, we'd get precious little uh, news coming out of Africa and even less that we can trust. Aside from your own excellent uh, reportage, where do you recommend people look to find information on not only Ethiopia but Africa? Chris, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, to be honest, you've, you've stunned me there. There, there is just not much uh, <laughs> you know, news sources that you can, yeah, I mean, I, I have to, you know, scrape like my own sources and, you know, from inside Ethiopia and um, there's very little uh, in the way of um, accessible media, you know, to, to follow what's going on. That's un ter terribly, you know, that, that's, that's the situation, but um, sort of like, I seem as if I'm blowing my own trumpet, but I would just advise people to, to try to follow what I'm writing on. It's been way too long, Finian, since the last time we spoke, and, and I hope that we can speak uh, soon, maybe in the new year, as uh, this uh, war that yeah. uh, Abiy Ahmed promised would be uh, over and done with in short order it doesn't look like that's going to happen at all, and this is going to be an issue that even grow that grows even worse as, as time goes on. Tragically, it, it, it is, Chris, and it's very tragic because, I mean, like where I lived, where my family lived, and we had many happy years there despite the poverty, but, you know, to think of it as a war zone now is really heartbreaking. And to think like coming up to Christmas, there's just thousands, tens of thousands of people just shoved into hellish misery. I mean, it's, it is just abominable that this Nobel Peace Prize charlatan is doing this and getting away with murder because the, where is the, where is the Western condemnation here? Very little, as far as I can see. Yes, and, and almost nothing from my own country, Canada. But that is something that we're getting well used to. Finian, thanks again for coming on the show. I want the rest of you to stick around. Janine's coming straight up with this week's Left Coast Events Bulletin. Some That's of the things to get up to in and around our town. Tiwala <laughs> ledu